Thank you, thank you very much, everybody, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for joining today's online meeting on ensuring appropriate patient access to plasma-derived medical products. Although I cannot uh, welcome you in person, as I would like uh, at the European Parliament, uh, it is a pleasure for me to host this uh, online meeting on such a crucial topic. As a medical doctor, patient access to care has always been on key, of key interest in my political career, including as an MEP. The European Parliament has, very, has been very committed to working together with stakeholders on access to care in the context of COVID-19 pandemic and behind. And I share, I fully share this commitment. Recently, the Envy Committee has been looking into issues of accessibility to key medicines in form of a known initiative report, which resulted in an European Parliament resolution published recently on the 17th of September 2020 on shortages of medicines, how to address an emerging problem. The report recognizes the need to collect more plasma in Europe for manufacturing plasma-derived medical products for European patients and to decrease reliance on third countries, such as the United States, particularly when it comes to plasma. I think that the pandemic, the pandemic push, put us much more aware of the difficulties of very complicated logistic chains and we cannot rely on them. With the COVID-19 pandemic, introducing additional pressure on the de delicate balance between global plasma supply and patients' clinical needs for plasma-derived medicinal products, the need for increased plasma collection has never been more critical. Aside plasma collection, reimbursement policies of procur or procurement practices also have a direct impact on access to plasma therapies. In the end, 300,000 patients across Europe with rare and often genetic conditions, such as primary immunodeficiencies, Guillain-Barré syndrome, other uh, inflammatory uh, neurologic uh, syndromes are reliant on these products to live a normal life, to have a normal life. I therefore cannot accept that today in European Union, patients still face numerous assess challenges to plasma-derived medicinal products. How can we address these changes, these challenges across the European Union? What can we policymakers do to ensure patient access to care? I'm looking forward to hearing from patient representatives, medical professionals, industry representatives, and of course, from the Commission, what concrete measures they consider should be taken at European and national level to ensure progress is made and patients have access to the medicines they need. Uh, with the Commission's uh, pharmaceutical strategy around the corner, I feel that today's discussion is very timely. And uh, I want to share with you the speech of uh, the President of the Commission, Mrs. van der Leyen, in the recent address to the European Parliament, we must really build the European Union for Health. I think that most citizens, most European citizens, really want that and we should hear the will of the European citizen. Without more, I will give the floor back to Mr. Maguire and to the speakers who have done us the honor of being present today. And I will follow this debate with a large interest. Thank you very much for your presence. Manuel Pizarro, thank you so much uh, for this introduction, for hosting uh, the event today as well. Uh, welcome to all of you. I'm Brian McGuire. I'll be the, the moderator for today's event. Uh, we have our first speaker uh, by video uh, today. He's unable to join us uh, live. So, uh, Levin Zanemans, he's a senior professor of health economics at the Faculty of Medicine at Ghent University here in Belgium. Team will bring the video up in just a second. Uh, we will have a series of uh, speakers today for you, followed by a Q&A, uh, which you'll be able to participate in. And we will put your questions uh, to the panelists uh, as best we can towards the end of the, the event today. If you want to uh, tweet 
uh, today the hashtag is access to PDMPS, nice and snappy, access to PDMPS, more or less than that. You can find that uh, on Twitter as well if, if you search for it. Please uh, tag the messages, send uh, comments as well, and our social media team uh, will retweet those and respond uh, to you as well. So if uh, we have the video ready uh, for uh, Professor Annemans, here we go. And uh, then we will have uh, Dr. Stefan van der Spiegel to follow after that. So let's uh, play this video. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Lieven Annemans, I'm a professor of uh, health economics at Ghent University and I'm happy to be here with you. I would like to share with you uh, some key elements of the report that uh, Ventura wrote on uh, plasma-derived uh, medical products. Um, I would like to start, however, with what I call the key principles of a good healthcare system. And those three principles are quality, solidarity and sustainability. Quality is obvious. Uh, we want good healthcare systems to deliver the best possible quality of care uh, to our patients and to our citizens. The second one, solidarity, means that two people with the same uh, need also deserve the same quality of care. It's a human right. Uh, it's Article 25 of the Declaration of Human Rights that states that every citizen has the right for good healthcare. The third uh, principle is sustainability. That means that if we still want to guarantee good uh, care for everyone in 10 or 20 years from now, we have to make sure that we don't waste the money in the system, that we spend our euros and our dollars uh, wisely. These three principles clearly apply uh, for the uh, PDMPs. Why? Well, first of all, quality, that's quite logic. We see that these products offer a lot of quali uh, yeah, qualities, uh, quality adjusted life years, uh, because they save lives, they improve the quality of life of patients, there are plenty of data on that, and also they have a, an important uh, socioeconomic benefit then, because people can have a normal life, pretty normal life, it can be uh, very productive, can contribute to the economy, so the socioeconomic benefits of these products are, are huge. Solidarity, there we see an issue, because as I said, everybody who can benefit from this product should also have access to these products. And that means that we have to um, guarantee that entire chain from donor uh, to patient. And there we see in that chain already some disruptions, and we have to avoid those disruptions. All those who are convinced about the value of these products, and I think everybody should be convinced about the value of these products, should also be convinced that we have to avoid any possible disruption at any point in that chain from donor to patient. It starts already with uh, getting the plasma. We see there that there is kind of an imbalance because there are four countries that are responsible for more than 55% of the obtain, obtaining the, the plasma. And we see that, yeah, that this is maybe not sustainable. We know that we will need even more of these products in the future because of the demographic changes and, and, and uh, these diseases require uh, longer and, 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 and for longer time uh, treatment. So that means that we have to find the balance there and that we have to find incentives that also more European countries can obtain more donors um, of plasma. It's not a coincidence that those four countries that I uh, refer to uh, apply clear incentives for their donors and that's really very effective and good practice and should be applied uh, more also in, in other countries. Availability also has to do with money, of course, and that brings us to the third uh, key principle, namely sustainability. And there we see that there, is, um, there are challenges on two levels. First of all, what we could call the, the formal patient access uh, procedures, uh, reimbursements. We see that not everywhere the reimbursement of these products is uh, optimal we need to look at what we call cost effectiveness. Uh, what is the cost of the products and what is their effectiveness? But we have to look at more. We see that more and more countries adapt their reimbursement uh, procedures and criteria to bring in two additional elements, namely the medical needs. And no doubt that the medical need is very high for most of the conditions that we, we treat uh, with, with, the, with the PDMPs. 
and we also have to bring in uh, budget impacts. I proposed, and it's also written in the, in, the, in the report, a concept which I call value informed and affordable prices. That means that the price of products is in relation to the value that they deliver to the patient, but we keep, we keep there in the calculation also um, um, the, the importance of the budget impact and the medical need. And by doing that, we will see that we can really find that these products can be value for money in that broader, in that broader concept. So we have to get away from the, the, what some people call the cost plus price, just give, give us your cost of your production and, and, and development and, uh, and that will be then your price with a little bit of margin. No, we have to pay for value. Value is, is of crucial importance, uh, especially now in a world where we, where, we, where we go to what we call value-based uh, healthcare systems. And with that regard, I would like to point to two other elements that are also clearly written in the report. The first is uh, cost containment measures. On first sight, it looks logic that, remember, given sustainability of healthcare systems, that countries try to contain uh, the, the costs of care. However, there are two dangers. First of all, it might be very linear sometimes, so not making a distinction anymore between products of high value and products of low value. And second, it doesn't take into account the complexity of some of the, the, the products. Uh, we can easily refer also to vaccines. In many countries, vaccines are uh, receiving an exemption of uh, cost containment because they are complex to produce and because they have a huge societal benefit. So I think when we talk about uh, PDMPs that the same criteria apply and we have to be really very careful with purely uh, cost containment which ends up sometimes to be really cost myopic and that's not what we want. We want to keep that value always in the picture when we want to make good healthcare decisions. And that brings us to another element that is tenders. Again, the same story. If tenders are purely based on price, then we get a race to the bottom of those prices. And moreover, we forget to bring in again the element uh, value. So it's normal again that uh, countries and healthcare systems organize tenders, but then it should be based on a logic that we call value-based procurement, that all the elements of the value are taken into account in the picture. And also that we have to make sure that when products are not interchangeable, that we allow several products still to be available to patients, that clinicians have the choice to work um, with those products. So it's very important that we um, pay attention to those, um, to those uh, issues. And that brings me to the conclusions of my uh, story today. So first of all, uh, I argued that we have to be very careful to avoid any disruption in that very important chain from donor uh, to patients and that we have to increase the number of donors. We will need more of these products in the future. So we need to increase and take measures uh, to increase uh, the, the number of donors. Second, when we uh, deal with reimbursement, there should be more harmonized and more clear criteria that take into account the value of the products, the cost effectiveness, the medical need, and the impact on the budget. And third, we have to be careful with measures that only look at cost and nothing but cost, because then we completely uh, forget uh, the value and, and the societal impact of the products, and those need always to be part of the equation. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I think we, there is room for improvement, I'm an optimist, uh, and we have to have an open dialogue to try to improve indeed the, the current situation uh, for the PDMPs. I invite everybody to read the report carefully, there is much more than I, than I was explaining now in this very short uh, uh, speech to you, and, uh, and I hope that you enjoy it and that it can help to improve indeed uh, the access uh, to patients because that's the ultimate uh, goal. Our thanks to Professor Animans, uh, excellent uh, introductory uh, presentation. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. St uh, Stefan van der Spiegel. He's head of sector at the Health Innovation and Substances of Human Origin at uh, DG Sante and the European Commission. Uh, Stefan, we're great uh, to have you with us today. Um, we can unmute you now and uh, you can.
commence. There we go. Thank you, Brian. You have uh, just to say, I think you're on earlier. So we're at 10 minutes and at eight minutes, I will, uh, will give you a two minute uh, warning and then uh, one minute's grace to wrap up, okay? That's always good. Thank you, Brian. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pizarro for bringing us together for this uh, very important uh, event and, and to have a look into this uh, very complex uh, issue of um, access to plasma derived medicinal products indeed. Um, I found the introductory presentation by uh, Professor Anumans very insightful. What I will bring you now is in a couple of minutes an overview of the uh, perspective and the work from the, the commission uh, on this field and we, this comes from uh, two angles. There's a, a dedicated angle on the field of uh, substances of human origin because plasma is considered in the EU a substance of human origin and a subject uh, especially its, its collection steps are subject to a specific legal framework. And then I indeed, um, as uh, Dr. Pissarra mentioned, the, the pharmaceutical uh, strategy is around the corner. So I will also give you a couple of um, um, basic elements uh, on that. So to start maybe, um, the why do we have an, an EU legal framework in, the, in this field? And uh, you might recall in the 80s and 90s that uh, across Europe we have got quite some uh, serious safety concerns because of uh, transmission of infectious diseases like HIV, hepatitis, true plasma derivatives and other um, substances uh, of human origin. There's quite some um, famous uh, cases and numbers in, in the UK, Italy, uh, Romania, also in France, there, this was quite uh, politically uh, an important um, topic. So that was the moment that the member states have given the European Union a mandate to legislate this field. And this mandate, next slide please. Yeah, this mandate is actually there to set safety and quality standards in the chain from donation to human applications. Yeah. I have some background noise, is that possible? Okay, so it's gone. So, and the change from donation to human application, all the steps from one uh, donor body to uh, a recipient body. And I won't go into details here, but there are EU requirements on the professionals on how they have to handle those materials, tests, work with the right donors. There's requirements on authorities in every country to oversee oversight. And there's requirements on us at uh, European Commission level where we support all those activities of, and, and oversight. For example, we are running rapid alert platforms here. Next, please. So this uh, legislation actually dates back from uh, 2002. Um, and so it's an older legislation. That's why the commission has uh, decided to run an evaluation of this uh, legislation. And we have, um, so basically to see if it's, serving its purpose and still fit for that purpose. And uh, we have end of last year published a report on that with some key findings and, and shortcomings. And I just want to bring you here uh, two of them which are most relevant for our discussion today. I think the first one is, is very much underlining what I think was already mentioned in, in the introduction by uh, Dr. Pissarro is that we have a concern in the EU about sustained uh, access and sufficiency to, to those uh, plasma derived medicine products because they are for a significant part provided or available thanks to the plasma collected and donated in the United States. About one third of plasma derivatives used in the EU are, um, are, are based on plasma that originates from the United States. And that of course makes us vulnerable uh, and makes uh, the supply for our patients vulnerable. Next. Yeah, there's a, another uh, finding that I think is very important to put on the table here, and that's uh, that uh, the very unique nature of plasma derived medicine products, and that's very different from any other pharmaceutical, is that actually to have them available, you need donors, you need humans, citizens uh, that can make uh, donations. And what we found uh, in our legal evaluation is that um, there's not really sufficient measures to protect those donors, that they can be trustfully uh, going to give donations 
knowing that they will be helping others, but also be safe themselves. And that is, a, I think, an important element here, because if we indeed want to increase plasma collection in the EU, which is a bit the conclusion of the previous slide I presented, then uh, we will need to have a um, stable and a trustworthy donor group and basis in the European Union. So it's important that they're then also well uh, protected. Next, please. Um, so that's the legal framework uh, that we deal with in the substance of human origin. And, and there are some imminent follow-up actions on that too. And I think the two concerns uh, presented here, there will be addressed in there. We, we soon will come with uh, our announcement on the, on the impact assessment, how we're gonna do that. Um, but in the meantime, we have already, uh, with, together with colleagues in the Council of Europe, brought together actually all key stakeholders needed in this, uh, as Professor Anderman said, chain from donor to recipient, because there's a lot of actors needed here to get this product, uh, those medicines to the patients. And there's therefore a lot of um, elements that need to be managed if we want to increase the, the plasma supply in the European Union. And I won't go through the, all the details here, but uh, you will see them on this side and on the next side. And you will, uh, first of all, you will see diverse actions from including increasing collection, but that means also having awareness uh, of donors that uh, they can donate, have to donate, and, and that is a safe, uh, that it's safe to do that. So they need donor protection measures. It also includes um, uh, good systems to, to collect and, and sufficient capacities in the different countries. And every country has a different way of uh, setting that up. Um, it also includes uh, monitoring uh, elements. It also need, includes good reflections on the good use of our supply of plasma derivatives because that is limited. Um, uh, and that's one element I, I want to underline with these two sides. And if you go already to the next slide, please, you will see actually there's a lot of actors involved here. And this is not something that one actor on his own can achieve to increase plasma supply in the EU. It is important that there are actions taken here, of course, in the European Commission, EU level, EDUCM membership, but also with manufacturers, with blood establishment, with patient and donor associations, and, and with the doctors who prescribe those therapies. So we need everybody on board and everybody needs to take his part of, of the role uh, and the job here. Next. And that brings me, of course, uh, on today, I cannot go without speaking a moment about COVID uh, because we, this was a situation we had already identified and was clear in 2019, but of course, we now are in the middle of the COVID crisis and COVID brings some additional risks uh, in, uh, to supply, uh, which includes, um, uh, of course, a reduction we have seen in, in collection volumes in, in Q2, but it seems to normalize now. So it's very important to, that we monitor uh, what will be the eventual impact in a couple of months from now on the supply of the plasma derivatives. And, and our colleagues in the European Medicines Agency are, are doing that. Uh, we also are trying to make the rules a little bit more flexible so that the supply, um, at least for regulatory reasons, uh, cannot be, uh, should not be put on hold. Next, yeah. Fortunately, COVID also brings some opportunities for plasma. Um, to start with, plasma can become a very important therapy and seems very promising as a therapy to treat COVID-19 patients in the critical phase if we can get antibodies um, derived from the donors that have recovered. So that means also uh, there's a kind of awareness building uh, that can attract new donors for uh, plasma. There's also some work undertaken by the commission to uh, support the collection capacities in the, in the member state. And we are currently applying a European support instrument fund for that. So next. So that was on the, on the framework on safety quality. So of course, as mentioned before, there's a specific framework now also on the table coming, uh, the pharma strategy, um, which um, again, where again, COVID very, makes very clear that there's a very high need for this framework. Uh, I think in the last months we have seen issues on 
international dependency of active ingredients. I think there's a very strong analogy with the discussions we are going to have here today. There, we have seen shortages on, on certain supplies of medicines. We have seen the need for crisis management and preparedness. Next. Um, and again, already before this COVID crisis, uh, it was really on top of the mission letter for our Commissioner of Health to look into ways to ensure supply of affordable medicines to the European citizens and to support the pharmaceutical industry when doing that. Um, so um, this actually brings me, of course, very close to the, the, intro, the presentation of, of uh, Professor Annemans, um, um, not only discussing the access chain from donor to recipient, but we also need to look in, indeed into elements of pricing, reimbursement, value of medicines, and because those decisions in the end will really be important for citizens or patients to have access to those therapies. To Next, man. please. I'm close to the end, uh, Brian. So the pharma strategy, as uh, you've seen at the moment, unfortunately, I cannot go into too much detail uh, on that. And that's because uh, it will be published uh, next month. It's expected to be on the 24th uh, of November. Um, and uh, but the pharma strategy will build around four uh, pillars. Uh, obviously, learnings from the COVID crisis, uh, building on the uh, ensuring the accessibility and affordability. I think that links very much to the messages that were brought by Professor Annemans. Supporting sustainable innovation, also including science digitalization, that's really also a facilitating role um, there that, that we need to explore and build up. And then um, the last one, I think, is the most relevant for discussions uh, today. Sorry, can you still go back? Thank you. That's about uh, reducing the shortages and securing our strategic autonomy. So that's really where our discussion of today uh, will fit, I think, I expect. Next. Yeah. So uh, in another way presented, these are, these are the objectives and possible actions we could consider. They would uh, affect the regulatory system, digitalization, prioritization of medical needs, access uh, elements, uh, securing supply and, and shortages, which probably as I said is, is the most relevant for today, but also affordability and health systems, financial sustainability. I think that's a difficult balance as was presented by uh, Professor Amans that we need to manage. And it's only when we have this balance managed that patients will access uh, to, to medicines. And then of course, there's also this global and international uh, aspect. Next. Yeah, and just just to end, I I, uh, I want to sum up a bit the process uh, that we've got on the on the pharma strategy. We we have our roadmap, which you have seen uh, just before summer. We have then also run an online public consultation, and that closed in September. And actually, again, and the results of that consultation, shortages were really flagged as a key concern of the participants in that consultation. And uh, as said, we are currently adopting and finalizing the strategy and it should be uh, we, sh we should go public next month but that's of course only the beginning then we'll start the real work and the implementation that's what i wanted to bring i think the next slide yeah that's uh, that's it thank you brian stefan thank you just for you you uh, go off there the it's clear the collaboration element within the ecosystem is critical to um, maintaining supply and but this, this, clearly that's not going to be enough to to close this gap with the United States when we're dealing with a third of the products. What does the Commission propose to do in, in terms of dealing with that uh, that Im importation gap? Um, I think at this moment I cannot really answer you much on that, I'm afraid. I, I, as you know, the pharma strategy is, is still... Uh, coming and I think as I also mentioned our um, impact assessment for the tissue cells uh, blood legislation is still to be presented. Thank you very diplomatic review. Stefan thanks Sorry. so much yeah. for the next presentation. Okay, okay stay with us and we'll come back with some uh, questions uh, and answers later on. Let's uh, go on to our next uh, speaker uh, Patricia Blomquist Markens and uh, she's the Vice President of International Activities at GBS CIDP Foundation a uh, patient organization. Patricia you're un unmuted. Thank you, Brian. Um, okay, you have uh, 10 minutes. I'll give you a shot at uh, two to go, okay? Thank you. Thank you. 
Firstly, I would like to thank the hosts and the organizers for allowing me the opportunity to speak to this esteemed audience. My name is Patricia Blomquist and I'm a, a volunteer for the GBS CIDP Foundation International. And as such, I advocate for people with Guillain-Barre syndrome, CIDP and variants. Um, let me tell you how I became involved with the foundation in the first place. Um, next slide, please. I'm taking you back about three decades to September 1990 when I experienced weird uh, symptoms um, and that led to a diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome, GBS for short. Uh, I ended up being hospitalized for four and a half months, two months out of which on the ICU and 35 days on a ventilator. This was followed by several months of rehab. Um, However, I consider myself uh, lucky. Personally, I was diagnosed fairly quickly and I received the uh, appropriate treatment being immunoglobulins derived from human plasma. And probably I was also lucky because it was just GBS and not one of its chronic variants, G CIDP and MMN. Next slide, please. Let me tell you a little bit about these disorders. To start with GBS, it's a disorder of the peripheral nerve, nerves that are attacked by the body's own immune system. It's acute and rapidly progressive, and in extreme cases, a patient might end up being completely paralyzed within a day. Uh, one of the main features, one of the main symptoms is muscle weakness in legs and arms, but these are leading to paralysis, and this paralysis can also extend to the face and respiratory muscles, um, making it about 25% of the patient's artificial ventilation necessary. The incidence is about one to two persons in every 100,000 per year. It's a monophasic disease, so generally only knows one episode of disease. The preferred treatment is immunoglobulins. Next slide, please. As for CIDP and MMN, the chronic cousins, these develop more, much slower than GBS, which can make diagnosis difficult. There are also, uh, the main symptom is muscle weakness leading to paralysis. The prevalence, um, meaning the number of people in the population at, at a given time with an illness, is for CIDP 28 per 1 million, and for MMN 10 per 1 million. Both of these disorder require long-term maintenance treatment with immunoglobulins. Next slide. So what happens if a patient with GBS is left untreated? There is a higher risk of the need for ventilation. There are more and more severe complications, possibly death, longer hospitalization and rehab, and probably more and more severe residuals such as pain, permanent disability, and chronic fatigue. As mentioned, this is a monophasic disease, so no maintenance treatments are necessary. Next slide, please. What happens if patients with CIDP and MMN are left untreated or are insufficiently treated? There will be progression of the disease leading to permanent nerve damage, which leads to severe and permanent disability. For instance, loss of hand function or wheelchair dependency. Are there alternatives to the treatment with immunoglobulins? For CIDP, yes, we can use corticosteroids or plasma exchange, but both of these are not really a long-term option uh, that you want to use for years on end. And for MMN, currently, there is no alternative than the treatment with immunoglobulins. Next slide, please. So GBS, CIDP, and MMN, are disorders that affect previously healthy and active people of all ages. And without the proper treatment, these disorders prevent the patients to participate in and contribute to society, which leads to financial and economic consequences for both patient and society. And untreated, these disorders hugely impact patients' quality of life as the immunoglobulin treatments are indispensable for them 
to regain and maintain function and therefore quality of life. Next slide, please. What about the patient's challenges? Of course, they already have to deal with a disease. But if you ask the patients what they want, their answer, their wish list is pretty simple. They want their therapy to be available. They want it to be safe and affordable. And a polite patient will probably add please, so I will as well. And that makes this little wish list ASAP easy to remember. Next slide, please. So as for product safety, with all the uh, safety measures in place for the collection of plasma and the production of immunoglobulins, that usually seems to be well taken care of. However, if there are problems with availability or affordability, these will lead to access issues for patients and therefore in that way endanger patient safety and their quality of life. The causes for access issues vary per country. So for Europe, there is no real one size fits all solution. <coughs> Next slide, please. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that patients' access to this indispensable and unique therapy with immunoglobulins must be ensured. As the need for immunoglobulins will only increase in the future, as we know it will, so will the need for plasma as starting material. Currently, there is already additional pressure due to COVID-19. So collective focus must be on increasing Europe's plasma collection in order to ensure availability while reducing Europe's reliance on US plasma. Thank you for your attention. Patricia, thank you so much. Uh, it's a, a really critical uh, perspective for us to have today. Can I just ask you, have you faced uh, supply issues, availability issues uh, personally? Uh, you, you're aware of people who have uh, faced uh, availability issues or affordability issues? Uh, from time to time, we hear heartbreaking stories of people not being able to get their, their next treatment. And um, uh, of course, they will deteriorate. And, and that is really heartbreaking to hear. So um, it's imperative for people to receive their, their treatments and receive them frequently. Have you been able to determine particular patterns of why these people have not been able to access the treatments? Uh, as it was mentioned before, it, it varies greatly. It okay. can be um, reimbursement issues, real availability, um, all sorts of, of problems. So, and that makes it difficult uh, to address, really. Okay. Is it useful for you to think in terms of a European system of address where uh, patients who do have access can call upon a wider lobby group to, to be able to, to action this? great and particularly more attention to, to the possibility to donate plasma. I think a lot of people aren't even aware of the possibility to donate plasma. Blood, okay, but plasma is, is for many people totally new. Thank you for that. I think that's uh, some, an issue we'll come back to later on in, in the discussion. Excellent, Patricia. Thanks so much for your contribution. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Annelie Larson. She's the Executive Director of Premier Immunobrist organization. She's a member of the International Patient Organization for Primary Immunodeficiencies. And Lee, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. you the floor is all yours. Uh, thank eight you. minutes and uh, I'll give you an extra yeah. uh, two heads up, okay? Thank you. Yes, and as Brian said, I work for the Swedish Patient Organization for Primary Immunodeficiencies, but today I represent the International Patient Organization. And I became involved in this uh, community for more than 20 years ago when my younger son was diagnosed with a primary immunodeficiency. Next, please. First, a few words about the primary immunodeficiencies. Uh, uh, PITS are actually more than 400 different chronic rare diseases. And uh, if you have a primary immunodeficiency, the is part of your immune systems are missing or function improperly. And this leads to repeated infections and sometimes they are really severe. And these are caused by genetic defects. And today over 33,000 patients are documented in the ACID registry, uh, the European patient registry. Uh, and looking at the prevalence, you can see that uh, 33,000 is just 15% of the persons expected to have a primary immunodeficiency in Europe. 
and of course everybody's maybe not in the registry yet but you can still see it, that there is many people still undiagnosed and most patients with PIDS are on prophylactic treatments such as immunoglobulins and the person with a premium deficiency has no alternative therapy to immunoglobulin. Next, please. And when it comes to availability for plasma products, we can see globally that the demand increases steadily every year, and that's more than the supply. And ED therapies have been under tension for many years. And around 70% of PID patients in the world have not been diagnosed yet. And Europe, as we already heard, has 38% uh, deficit if we compare the plasma needed for the development of immunoglobulins versus the plasma that is actually collected in the region. This means that Europe are dependent on plasma from the US. I think this makes the situation very fragile. In Europe, we also already heard four countries collect the most of the plasma. And the primary deficiency are recognized as a priority indication for ED treatment on the WHO list of essential medicines. And this is both for adults and children. Next, please. And it is a special production process for plasma products. As a patient, you have to rely on that someone is willing to give you a part of their blood or plasma. And safety for donors and safe medicines for persons receiving the immunoglobulins is absolutely crucial. And the way from the donor to patient is very long and full of possible disruptions. And in worst case, disruptions means no or limited access to medicines. And this is not good for patients. If no treatment, there is a risk of infections and that can cause organ damages. And this means maybe also shortened life due to these damages. And of course, you're also at risk of dying from severe infections. And if you have frequent infections, this leads to absence from work, school, and social isolation. And this affects quality of life and the mental health. And of course, it's worrying to not know when you can have your next therapy. Next, please. Excess challenges vary among the EU member states and from time to time. And uh, in recent years, some companies have decided to leave a country. It can be due to price or other issues. Excess challenges can also have other causes connected to management, tender system, or legal aspects. Limited excess makes the situation unstable for patients, physicians, and nurses, and can be tricky to handle. But increased demand of immunoglobulin, but without enough increase in plasma collection to meet this demand is a key issue. And this far in Sweden, we have not heard of any patient that has not has been able to get their immunoglobulin treatment. But in May 2019, we had a plasma conference in Stockholm. And then the nurses that attended the meetings, they told us that they sometimes have problems to get the immunoglobulin for the patients that comes to the hospital to the treatment. They had to negotiate with other departments at the hospital just before the patients arrived. And the doctors that attended our conference, they also expressed that it is to be, has to be priori priorities to, at place at all hospitals in case of tensions. And this was before COVID-19. Next, please. Our current reality is that in addition to the problems of availability that patients with PIDs used to face in the past, we are now also facing challenges that COVID-19 has started to pose on your, our community. IPOPI has received a report from their member organizations in the EU that in some countries there has, no be, has been limited access to healthcare settings during this pandemic. And this maybe will postpone diagnosis and maybe delay treatment. And in the beginning of the pandemic, many patients were switched to subcutaneous home treatment. And this meant that this under a period was not easy to get a hold of some on, on the treatment. And there are also signals about decreased levels of EG products in some countries. And we also heard that some newly diagnosed patients have been asked to wait to receive the treatment. And some patients have been requested to increase the time between infusions. And this can also, of course, lead to more infections. Patient organizations and PID specialists have started receiving notification about the reduced availability of EG products in hospitals and that the choice of different products may be limited in the coming months due to the drop in the plasma and blood collection. 
And it is difficult to know how much COVID-19 has affected the plasma donations and how this will affect the availability of PDMPs now and in the years to come. We still don't know. Next, please. And what can be done to improve the situation? Plus, the platform of, plas of plasma use protein users gathered in January 2019 different stakeholders in the field of blood and plasma. And together they agreed on a set of principles to encourage blood and plasma donation in Europe. The principles included, for instance, increased supply, development of policies based on facts and science, and they also saw a need for strengthened plasma phoresis programs and a need for a regionally balanced plasma collection. And they also called for future EU legislation on PDMCs to be more patient-centered. And now, more than urgent never to secure treatment with EG and other PDMPs. Next, please. And I agree upon the, about the importance to look at the access to medicines for patients from the patient's perspective. And I think it's important to keep in mind that it is for these persons and others like them across the EU, we all together need to find the solutions to secure their life-saving treatment. To start with, we call for an open dialogue to evaluate the effect of COVID-19 to secure access to plasma products now and in the years to come. So, and in countries where there are no demand managing plans, we hope they will start develop them very soon. And I will also th thank you very much for that. So, I, and hopeful today because there are so many committed persons attending this meeting. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anneli. Thank you also for your positivity. Uh, it's clear that there's uh, this is a subject which is drawing more and more uh, attention. I just wanted to to ask you about. Uh, the, those that were diagnosed with PIDs as well, you used to say there, there are many uh, undiagnosed, in fact that it's, it's many more un, who remain undiagnosed compared to those who are currently diagnosed. So as diagnosis uh, becomes better, more effective as well, uh, the, the need uh, for uh, PDMPs is going to increase as well. So we're not just looking at a stable uh, problem, we're looking at one that actually has uh, really uh, could substantially increase in the future as, as testing and diagnosis improves as well. Would that seem correct to you? Yes, it's correct. And of course, all of the persons I referred to that was, uh, it, they will not need immunoglobulins, but uh, many, many of them will need immunoglobulin because the antibody deficiencies are the most common. Okay, thank you. So uh, we're not just facing a, 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 a crunch because of COVID, we're also facing uh, something perhaps even more significant uh, as testing becomes uh, more accurate. Thank you. Stay with us and uh, we'll come back at some of these issues in, in the Q&A as well. Thank you so much. Uh, just put you on mute there. And uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Isabella Quinti. She's a professor of internal medicine and immunology head uh, primary immune deficiency unit at the Sapienza University of Rome. Uh, Isabella, uh, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And I can hear you clearly. Your presentation's there. You have uh, 10 minutes. I'll give you a shout at uh, two minutes to go. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm a clinical immunologist. So I'm taking care of patients with adult primary immune deficiency. So next, please. Uh, we all know and we heard just now that immunoglobulin therapy is a life-saving treatment in patients with primary immunodeficiency because this is the only way to replace a missing function. And so there are no other treatments, as just said before, for these patients with primary immunodeficiency. So the next one. And again, you saw the number before. I just want to show you here that most of the patients that are, that are in the uh, European Re uh, Society uh, Registry for Primary Immunodeficiency are affected by antibody deficiency. But we should take into our account also that most of the other primary immunodeficiency require the immunoglobulin treatment. So this is a urgent need and there is no way to replace this treatment for this patient. So next one. But we should focus mainly on patient outcome. What does it mean patient outcome? We know that healthcare delivery systems are quickly changing in response to economic pressure and concern about the quality of the care. 
but the system of care itself is an important determinant of patient outcome. We just heard the difference within the European country, uh, countries in the different health system they have, the different strategy they have to take care of patients. So elucidating the effect of the system of care of patient, on patient outcomes required new methodological approach in order to identify what works in which setting and in what condition. And we go to the last point. Personalized health research represents a further methodological challenge since emphasis is placed on the individual response that, rather than on the population. The next one, please. So what we have to consider to individualize the treatment. We have to consider the disease heterogeneity. We have to, do, to identify which is the best dose for that given patient. So to optimize the immunoglobulin dose, and we should take into account the patient quality of life. Next one. And I have also to say that even within the same clinical disease, so clinical phenotype of primary immunodeficiency are quite variable also within the same disease. Therefore, the suggested protective high TRAF IgG level might not be considered a general goal. This explains why in the published paper we have different results on those in the efficacy. Because we should take into consideration the spectrum of clinical immunological abnormalities that occur in the, with time in the same patient. Even in the same patient, the need may change over time. And the treatment option should be planned on the basis of conditions the clinical condition associated that are mainly represented by chronic lung disease, autoimmune manifestation, enteropathy, and uh, they lose protein by enter within when they have enteropathy, so they need more immunoglobulin, malabsorption, tolerability, and if they are also under other treatment for severe condition, we know that patients with primary immunodeficiency have a high incidence of cancer. Next one, please. So, what we are observing in the last years. Uh, this also has been already underlined. We observe an increase in the demand of plasma and the consequent need to increase the number of donors. We increase the change in methods to improve IgG recovery and to increase the productivity as, as response to the clinical demand, demand. Introduction of immunoglobulin treatment with higher concentration, change in time of administration with increase in rate of infusion, Introduction of immunoglobulin treatment administered by subcutaneous route that initially were confined only to patients for, for patients with primary immunodeficiency, but now are extended to other clinical indications that often require a higher uh, number of infusion. Uh, in this context, for example, there are new label indications for secondary antibody deficiency, and as has been mentioned also before COVID-19. Next one, please. So just to show you how many are the possible new secondary immunodeficiency that have indication for the immunoglobulin intravenous or subcutaneous treatment. I'm not going to read everything, but just to mention B-cell malignancy. B-cell malignancy is a huge number of patients. For uh, immunoglobulin, are necessary in some patients who, who develop antibody defect following chemotherapy, and also in patients after bone marrow transplantation, and secondary immunodeficiency also that comes after immunosuppression and systemic inflammatory disease. Next one, please. Next one. Just to mention rituximab. Rituximab is a very widely uh, use treatment for uh, B cell malignancy, and there are many, many patients who are uh, anti who becomes antibody def deficiency after that treatment, and sometimes they are symptomatic, and sometimes they need uh, immunoglobulin. So next one, please. Now COVID. COVID is not only a, a new uh, challenge for us. Uh, um, covalescent plasma has been used, but also some companies are preparing hyperimmunoglobulins. And this is also a new aspect that should be addressed. Are these useful? Uh, this is uh, exactly what we expect for the future. And we don't know if this will increase the shortage of polyvalent immunoglobulins for our PID patient. And again, uh, polyvalent immunoglobulin are administered at higher dosages. 
And this is in COVID because uh, this is a possible treatment for, and there are also some papers that have been published. So for COVID patients, not only convalescent plasma, these are uh, uh, um, under study at the moment, but polyvalent immunoglobulin at higher dosages together with low molecular weight heparin had, are already in use for patients with COVID. Next one, please. In addition, we should know something more, and I would focus the last few slides on this. Uh, immunoglobulin have a multiple effect on multiple cells and immune system function, and this function and this interference are still largely to be checked in vitro and in vivo study. The next one, just an example, uh, for example, immunoglobulin are important to suppress the persistent immune activation. Imagine that IgG is not only a molecule, it's not, not only an antibody, it's an active molecule, in the, it's a biologically active molecule. And for example, uh, immunoglobulin, uh, IgG, suppress the persistent immune activation. And so the spectrum of action is very wide and the, the interference with many, many different cells the network of the immune system uh, should be further analyzed, but we should take it should be taken into consideration when we speak about polyvalent or uh, in general uh, immunoglobulin. Next one. And this is so my conclusion: the administration of immunoglobulins induce multiple effects on the immune system functions, and the knowledge of these effects must be better evaluated, must guide future decision and treatment choice and should guide clinical and basic research. And so therapy should be individualized. And this is my last point. I would like to consider this and I would like that all the people who attend this meeting consider that immunoglobulin cannot be considered a generic drug. Uh, someone before me spoke about the possibility that immunoglobulin go into tender. Uh, it, it, this is really impossible because all kinds of products are different, not, not in terms of efficacy, but in terms of biological eff eff effect and in terms of tolerability. And so I thank you for the attention, but please consider uh, this is uh, something I add, it's not finished. So our patients also need the protection on the mucosal side. And so for the future, it is possible that we need immunoglobulins with high IgA and IgM content and some possibility to protect mucosa might come from the nebulized IgG and IG, IgA and IgM for the prevention of respiratory tract infection in PID. Next slide. So this is my last conclusion. Personalized health research represents methodologic, methodologic challenge since the emphasis is placed on the individual response that, rather than on the population. And I thank the, all of you, and these are the, the actors of the Italian network on primary immunodeficiency. Thank you very much. Isabella, thank you so much. Uh, that was super interesting. Um, I just, we'll come back to the economics of this and how the, the supply chain and the ecosystem works uh, during the, the broader discussion. But uh, it just strikes me that you're talking about personalized uh, healthcare, but and the, the non-generic nature of the, the immunoglobin as well. So uh, you, is this simply not a mature market? Are we at the infancy of research uh, for these products and uh, for this type of treatment as well? And if that's the case, what do you think needs to be done in Europe to address that uh, lack of diversity of treatment options? Uh, I, need, I think that Europe uh, uh, should be considered as a whole country, but the difference in one country by country by country and, and another country are so, so, so big. In Italy, for example, uh, we have tender for immunoglobulin. And this is something that should be absolutely not allowed because tender means that you are forced to use a product that has the lowest price. And uh, this is absolutely unacceptable for us. We, we need to have the um, wider possibility to use whatever we have in the market and to personalize this uh, for that given patient that requires. For science, basic science, we are uh, working a lot. So for basic science, I think we are plenty of data. 
And, but I think the, also this data should be uh, not confined to very, very few people who are specialized in that uh, given aspect. I mean, I think that uh, this data should be also taken into consideration when we consider immunoglobulin. And the knowledge of this basic effect is not very well spread. Okay, and Professor Anneman spoke earlier about quality adjusted life years as well. Is this excluded from the tender process in terms of consideration of cost benefit? Sorry, uh, no, they don't consider cost benefit. They consider only the price for the tender. For example, okay. and, and do you think this could be addressed? Is this a lack of education on the part of uh, those involved in the procurement service? Or is there some other dynamic there that simply forces down cost? Because you know, if the health ministry is really talking to the finance ministry, the, the cost saving over the longer term is there to be had if it's done properly, right? Now, even if you consider that even the, the therapy, uh, you should every year, according to the tender, we should change the treatment and the, the kind of problem for that given patient. This gives you the idea on how wrong is this process. Isabella, thank you so much. Let's talk about that a bit more, more later on uh, today also. Uh, let's uh, go to our last uh, presentation, which is uh, with uh, Oliver Schmidt, uh, General Manager at CSL Bearing Italy and Chair of PPTA EU Board. And Oliver, you're on earlier, can you hear me now? Yes, I do, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Eight minutes to give you a uh, heads up and then you have two minutes more. Thank you. Excellent. So thank you, Brian. Uh, my name is Oliver Schmidt, as already stated. Today I'm here at the Chairman of the European Board of PPA. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pissar for giving us the opportunity to show also the industry view on the topic which has already been stated. I have to anticipate that several of the messages I will state and uh, emphasize have already been mentioned, so therefore you can see how important it is to work in this kind of system with different stakeholders. So having stated that, just a brief next slide, please. Uh, just uh, to say who is PPDA, uh, which I present today. PPDA is a um, means plasma protein therapeutic association, is a global trade association and represents private plasma collection centers as well as manufacturers of life-saving plasma proteins. Uh, PPDA uh, member companies have a very strong manufacturing presence in Europe. As we already heard, uh, roughly 60% of the plasma protein therapies described, uh, prescribed in, in Europe are coming from Europe. Unfortunately, this means that there is also here a dependence of uh, product coming from the United States. What are the main focus PPDA is working on? The two areas are, exactly as already mentioned today, ensure patient access to safe and effective PDMPs. And secondly, ensure a balanced global sufficiency of plasma. Next slide, please. This slide shows uh, the different PPDA member companies and uh, their collection centers. They're spread, as is already has been stated, among Europe and the um, US. Uh, you see here data from 2019, more than 840 PPA source plasma collection centers are located in the US. Meanwhile, 150, 100, more than 150 collection centers are situated in Europe. So you all clearly see here that there is a, a mismatch in general terms. If we go uh, to the next slide, please, you will see here uh, a brief introduction on plasma and plasma proteins. Um, you heard a lot about immunoglobulins today and how they're used, but let's do one step back and try to understand, first of all, what is plasma? If you think about your blood, 55% uh, of the blood is plasma, 44% are red blood cells, 1% are white blood cells and platelets. If you then uh, you just go into the plasma by itself, so 92% of plasma is water, just water. 7% are proteins we're talking about, and 1% are the ingredients. You now move to the right and see, uh, there are a few examples of um, plasma uh, 
derived medicinal products which are fractionated and fused out of plasma. You see albumin, you see Ig, which are also known as antibodies, and this is a topic we are talking mainly today. But there are also other rare diseases which are fully depending on plasma therapy proteins. So therefore, what you can say today that uh, in Europe, roughly 300,000 European patients were in these therapies to treat a variety of rare and chronic and potentially life-threatening conditions. So if you go please to the next slide. So what we already can uh, understand here is plasma is, is a natural, it's a scores and a costly resource. We discussed about the lack of availability. Uh, as Isabella also stated, PDMPs are unique biological medicines and they're not interchangeable. Uh, most of these, it was also mentioned by uh, Anneli, most of these PDMPs are life-saving essential medicines and therefore also recognized by the WHO. Um, we were talking about the complexity of uh, time uh, to, to produce plasma, uh, plasma derived metal toxins. It takes between seven to 12 months from the donation uh, of plasma to uh, the um, supply uh, to the, the, of the finished product to the patient. So this is also, this long lead time also explains why certain products not immediately are available. So another important piece, which is very particular for plasma der uh, derived medicines are their high share of fixed costs in production. Uh, we're talking about roughly 60% which is fourfold the uh, amount, which are the percentage which is normally calculated for classical pharmaceuticals. And uh, if we're talking about the ecosystem in which PDMPs are located, this is, PDMPs are really part of a very fragile uh, system which has to be well balanced. Let's have a blick, uh, uh, short uh, view into the uh, ecosystem. So, in order to have a functional system, uh, you have uh, to have plasma donation, regular plasma donation. Uh, this already today is not the case. And as we also heard, it is not the case because not only for COVID, but also for other, for, uh, for an increase of uh, plasma, of request for uh, plasma derived medicinal products. We have, we face very complex relations in this ecosystem. Of course, we have to follow strict uh, safety procedures and a lengthy and costly manufacturing process, as already mentioned. So despite uh, a strong footprint of uh, European manufacturing sites here in Europe, there is a, a, a growing reliance on plasma from the US, as it was mentioned several times already today. This also has been recognized, it was also mentioned by Stefan van der Spiegel, by the Commission's report on the evaluation of EU legislation of blood tissue cells, uh, tissues and cells. So uh, on the other hand, it was also mentioned by uh, Professor Arnemans that the overall value which is brought by PMPs have been demonstrated uh, as uh, in clinical or societal value evaluated for one, uh, for one disease area, which we were talking about before, crime and divisions, as roughly 1 billion euro a year. So quite an important uh, contribution, which these products in this specific indication are able to give. So if we're talking about the fragile ecosystem, so the EU plasma collection is not keeping pace with the growing clinical need for video and piece. This one piece, it was also mentioned by several uh, presenters today that we have a very heterogeneous reimbursement coverage and uh, policies within Europe. So each country has its own, uh, its own ideas how to organize it. In addition to that, we also have a, uh, measures such as callback, payback, rebates with a further impact, the stability of this ecosystem, therefore limit an optimal patient access. Yeah, and then this year we had to, uh, to, to to face, and we're still facing COVID-19 pandemic, which hit even more this uh, fragile balance of this ecosystem. What we already can see is or stated that we have to learn more uh, from these experiences in order to be better prepared for future pandemics. 
If we now look into what PPDA proposed, especially in the light of the current process of uh, the elaboration of the Youth from Zero strategy, which was mentioned by Stefan Trill at the beginning of this round table. So, um, and areas which need to build into the, uh, this is, uh, first of all, address the reliance on important matter of starting material. Here, of course, we are mainly focusing on starting material, this growing reliance on plasma from the S. Um, it was also mentioned by some of, uh, I think it was Anneli, uh, that there are four countries in Europe, Germany, also Czech Republic and Hungary, which allows a coexistence of privately owned plasma collection centers where, together with the public ones. And interestingly, these four countries today are absolutely uh, self-sufficient in uh, if we consider the nation of plasma and they produce even more compared to that what they need. So it is clear that Europe needs to collect more plasma to increase uh, its contribution to global supply and to reduce this reliance of US plasma. This was clearly strengthened the, uh, the resilience of the national healthcare system and in this context also meet grown clinical, meet the grown clinical demand, which was mentioned. Um, therefore, uh, European policies uh, must facilitate the collection of more plasma in Europe. In this context, however, we also stated that this is a question of stakeholders and network. So in this context, if we go to the next slide, please. Just two minutes to go. Yeah, thank you. I'm absolutely fine. Thank you. Uh, so uh, PDA launched last week uh, during the International Plasma Awareness Week uh, a plasma campaign called It's in Us All to Save a Life, Donate Plasma. This, this uh, campaign calls for more plasma donations across Europe and also for policymakers to build the adequate policy framework at both EU and national levels to achieve this objective. So this absolutely aligned with the statement of the EU Commissioner Kyriakidis. Uh, she stated at the World Blood Donor Day, uh, 14th of June, that this year, as we continue the fight, uh, the fight against COVID-19 pandemic, your donations are needed more than ever. So this is well, the first time that it was clearly said how important it is. So the next slide, please. So PBDA also proposed not only focusing on plasma, but on uh, plasma on the excess. So to ensure great access and ability of pharmaceutical products to patients. It was mentioned that Europe should be one country. I think Isabella stated it, but it, it's not the case. So we have completely different reimbursement systems. In some countries, PDMPs are not reimbursed at all or only for a very narrow group. Uh, we have uh, therefore also different ways of, uh, of making uh, therapies available. And this of course will not help us in order to maximize the clinical socioeconomic benefits which have been mentioned also by Professor Annemans. So, and again, uh, what we have to do is we have to uh, try to reduce or get rid of the client payback. Here in this context, it is positive to see that some countries have recognized the uniqueness of uh, these plasma derivative, uh, plasma derived medical products and lifted or at least reduced these kind of taxes. So all this would clearly help to improve the overall situation of the European healthcare. So in conclusion, we can state that you member states supported by EU policies should apply effective measures in collaboration with the private industry. And this is important, the collaboration here to promote and grow plasma donations across Europe to fulfill the clinical need for the PDMPs. Ensure the broadest reimbursement coverage for all patients in order to maximize these benefits which have been shown also in the Ventura report. And lastly, optimize your important policies in order to make a real product and to maintain the PDMPs industry sustainability. So that value is considered, not a specific price as it was mentioned by Isabella. So therefore to offer a treatment uh, for all patients in Europe. At the end of that, let's make a strong statement here. PDA urges decisive actions in Europe to increase plasma donations especially in patients which are impacted significantly by COVID-19. So with that, I conclude here and thank you for your attention. 
Thank you so much, Oliver. I just to follow up a little bit on this as well on the the donate plasma campaign as well. Across your people know how to donate blood. They know what's involved in that. Most people really wouldn't have a clue what plasma is, except that it's something to do with blood. You agree with that? Yeah, unfortunately, because if we're thinking about uh, plasma and uh, and blood, the most people who donate think about don uh, of blood, and they're they're used to to uh, donate uh, blood. My son uh, himself, he he was used to donate blood. He never ever thought about the opportunity also to donate plasma. So it's about education, but it's also about the way how we are used to, to work over the years and therefore and probably uh, the uh, upcoming upcoming need for for uh, for for production uh, for for donate and produce more and more plasma derivatives so this is something we have to work together in order to create this event do you, you know the european union doesn't have autonomy uh, over member states health policy is there anything really to stop it from promoting an education campaign which uh, advises about what plasma is and how how it should be donated and why it should be donated is uh, is that the first step in terms of what we're looking at as a harmonized market uh, i believe education is is key is key uh, and education should of course not only be done by the industry because this could be seen uh, in, a, in the wrong way so here it was already mentioned that the uh, the way to work together uh, in the system between patient association donor associations industry regulators means at EU level as well as the national uh, the national governments they clearly have to work together in order to create the awareness and consequently also the increase of donations in addition it was clearly mentioned that only four countries currently in Europe allow this coexistence of privately owned and, and uh, public plasma collection centers i think also here it's interesting to see that only these four countries are able today to collect more than 100 percent of plasma so it means that they're absolutely self-sufficient so there are several areas i think where both commission as well as um, national governments can act just uh, before we go to the, the Q&A on the, these four countries, what's to be learned from the example of these four countries? Is, is, is it as simple as the fact that they're just collecting more and producing more, or uh, do they categorize uh, illnesses and treatment plans in a different way that appears to have a, a surplus? Uh, you know, and can the commission uh, benchmark this kind of approach as uh, best practice and what the other 23 member states should be doing? I believe, first of all, uh, the focus here is, of course, about uh, plasma donation and the way okay. how it's organized. Uh, the way then how treatment is done is a different is this a different piece here, and I think this cannot directly be linked to each other. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to uh, bring our panelists back in uh, for a conversation. We're going to add one. Uh, Thomas uh, Klusinski, he's a partner at uh, Ventura, a uh, consultancy providing healthcare and life sciences consulting. Thomas, you're still with us? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brian, for the introduction. So good, uh, good to have you. And uh, we have some questions already in uh, from our audience. So thank you for those. And please uh, keep sending questions in. We're going to go through some of those uh, right now. Uh, put them in the Q&A section, if you will, and the team will try to highlight uh, those uh, to me. I have, some of them have been answered a little bit, but uh, we're, we're going to refer to them, and uh, our panel can take a look at those uh, too. Let's go to one of the questions uh, right away. And thank you also for everybody staying on time, and uh, we're right on 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 the mark. Uh, so that that uh, gives more time to discuss as well. Uh, you give us two. We're going to take your second one here first. And for the management of shortages. Uh, Eurodis, the European Organization for Rare Diseases, supports the idea that the supply should be coordinated at the EU level, considering demand and offer and monitoring stocks. This should no longer be left at national level, says Francois, and member states can compete against each other in purchasing suppliers or can accumulate more product than they need. Hence, an EU coordination is needed to ensure solidarity among member states. Tomas, you want to take that? Sure, very happy. Uh, first of all, I never had the chance to, to thank um, uh, 
Dr. Pizarro for invitation and the illustrious panel for, for having me and allowing me to answer some of the questions. Uh, so I think the question is, is a very tricky one. And I think it is a tricky one uh, on two counts uh, because it poses uh, a proposition of the ideal state of things, i.e. an ultimate solidarity and an EU harmonization of something that is currently so heterogeneous. So let's imagine a situation where all the countries have the same uh, infrastructure and the same systems of collecting plasma. Only under these conditions, this harmonization would make sense or would be effective. I think Oliver and many others have mentioned repeatedly, and you can probably uh, look at the greater detail in our white paper, is that the collection of plasma is as heterogeneous and legislated and regulated in as many ways as there are countries in Europe. Having said so, of course, we all would like that harmonization. In the meantime, however, what is the utmost, utmost objective and urgency is to increase that plasma. If it means that in Poland or in Portugal, plasma is increased by both ethical and efficacious. That's absolutely fine. We need to build the base to ensure sufficient supply, not at this stage talk about harmonization. If I'm being too brash about that answer, this is only because of the passion for the ensuring the basics. And once those basics are ensured, we can start talking about harmonization, we can start talking about a pan-European system. That's an ideal, and that's an ideal we all strive for, but let's sort out the country-level basic first. Thank you. And uh, let me see, we, is Manuel Pizarro still with us just at the moment? He's still online, but uh, he's ready to speak. And also welcome to Emil Gooking, MEP. He's uh, joined us too. Uh, he joined the, the conversation uh, this afternoon, I hope, also, and he gives some remarks towards the end. Uh, anybody else from the panel want to take that that uh, question? Any quick comments there? I think, Brian, if I may, I do not want to monopolize it, but there was a subset of the question that concerned a compensation, which I sure. think well, also mentioned it's, it's, uh, that the compensation for um, human parts or blood or plasma uh, has some something of an unethical dimension. Uh, and I think this, I really want to dispel confusion around that. And that's incredibly, incredibly important because there's so much confusion in that people perceive compensation for the donor who spends time to get to the place of donation, who spends, uh, who, for whom it is extremely inconvenient. Let's remember that plasma donation takes much longer and is actually much more unpleasant than a whole blood donation. So what I'm saying here is that the confusion is around compensation incentive versus what it actually means. It is indeed a compensation for the time spent and the inconvenience, not an incentive or purchase of plasma. And let's remember that across Europe, there are at least 15 to 18 different ways of directly or indirectly compensating that inconvenience. There are either monetary nation, tax breaks, free days of work, all of those have the same purpose, to ensure that the donor who willingly wants to donate has the ability to do so. And that's the non sequitur of a question like this. I really, really strongly urge you to read a little bit more about this in our paper yet again, which explores this issue. And it exists for whole blood plasma, for whole blood, it exists for plasma. These measures are the same. Let's, uh, uh, and they are effective. And I know Oliver would like to comment on that, so I'll yield the floor. No, oh, thank you, thank you very much, Thomas. I'm very happy that you do this up because, as you already stated, there is a lot of misunderstandings. Misunderstanding because here we're talking only about compensation. You already mentioned that there are several countries. You mentioned 15, 18, where we have different kind of compensation. The country I have the pleasure to live in, Italy. Uh, if you're an employed person, you get one day off. Uh, so this is also a kind of compensation. So if we think about the compensation which is given in these four countries where we have the coexistence of a privately owned and, uh, and public centers, collection centers or transfusion centers, it's exactly as Thomas stated. So if we keep in mind what is offered as compensation compared to that, what, uh, what uh, the people offer in time to donate this important substance we were talking, we were talking about. So I think we really cannot pay, I really cannot talk, uh, talk about any kind of, of payment or something or remuneration. 
this is pure compensation. And this is uh, quite often a very dogmatic uh, emotional discussion and not very fact-based. Okay, Stefan, uh, European Union uh, officials and uh, MEPs are all very familiar with compensation for their activities. Is there any principal objection from the Commission side to finding a, a sensible compensatory uh, structure or to recommending a sensible compensatory structure as a means to ensure uh, access to supply? Yeah, I think in uh, in saying not, uh, Brian, um, we uh, we have uh, in EU uh, a principle that's really highly um, regarded is is the non commercialization of the human body, as was mentioned, and relate to that the voluntary unpaid donation. But I think it's right, as uh, Thomas and Oliver laid out, that um, uh, even if that principle is in place in the EU and actually in all the member states, because all member states, we served with them a couple of years ago, and all the member states consider they are implementing the principle of voluntary and paid donation. But if, if you then look into the, the detail, and there's a commission report on that, you see in it very different uh, ways of filling uh, that out. Um, so, uh, and it can include uh, as, um, as some countries like Austria and, and Germany where, where the private collectors are active, it, it can include some um, compensation uh, financially. Um, it uh, can include, as was mentioned, uh, days off uh, or, other, or other elements. So there is already, I think, quite a lot of flexibility uh, on that. I think it's, it is important to, um, that member states have that comp uh, th that uh, flexibility because they they have very different they have decided in very different ways on how blood and plasma can be collected in their countries and I think in function of that um, they also take different decisions or have different preferences on 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 this aspect. Okay, I want to bring Mama Fazaro in just a second, but uh, just to add on on I'll have you there. The, the education element to do with uh, donating plasma as well. You're sure you can go and talk about uh, compensation, but if people don't actually know about the process to begin with, then the compensatory element just isn't a discussion on the table. So you know, do you foresee a role for uh, the commission uh, to, to boost uh, awareness and uh, to, to boost education about uh, the plasma in general? I think, uh, to be honest with you, our, our role is, is uh, relatively limited. We see over the, across the EU that uh, there is a need for more awareness, but there's also more awareness happening. And that is both in uh, systems where you have private and, and public actors, collectors, as well as we see in, in several countries that only have public collectors, that there is really an increasing effort and awareness uh, on, on this possibility to donate plasma. Um, as commission and say we do not really uh, interfere in, in uh, setup of national healthcare uh, systems um, but we, we try to and, and also it is difficult because because of course a, a campaign in, in one country needs a lot of specificities for that country not just to mention the language but also the sensitivities and, and the background of the, of the population some religious factors are very different there's a lot to be taken into account uh, i think what, what we can do are are maybe more um, punctual uh, elements like was like oliver mentioned uh, our commissioner kirakides and in the last world blood donor day she has actually extended a little bit the, the call and the thanks for donation from blood only, whole blood only donation to also um, plasma donation. So it's this kind of elements indeed that, that we can easier uh, okay. organize. Thank you. Manuel Pizarro. Well, thank you very much. It was a very interesting debate. I only want to make one or two points that I think that could be important. I, I'm, uh, I have a great, great hope about uh, the new strategies from uh, about health policies in Europe. I think that we cannot say that the treaties are a limitation to the intervention of the European Union in the health issues. There are a large margin to intervention. And uh, for instance, I think that we should debate, clearly debate on what, what are our strategic goals. If we speak, and we are speaking more and more in this uh, pandemic uh, era, about uh, autonomy of Europe in the in the in the 
supply of uh, important goods and important medical uh, goods, I think that we should also have a, a goal, which is to create complete and full or European autonomy in plasma-derived medicinal products. And so if we put that in that way, we should see what uh, strategies, what measures, what money should we put in that strategy. And I think that uh, we can have a, a global approach uh, with all the European countries, involving all the European countries, and trying to help all the European countries to arrive to that objective, to that goal, uh, how to make uh, public awareness campaigns, how to make, uh, how to establish uh, guidelines about compensation to the, the donors of plasma, which could not be confounded with paying pl uh, human plasma, but can, but can be given to people to to, to really compensate the time and the, the, and the uncomfort of, of uh, being donor. So, we, we, but we, we, sh we should say, I hope that perhaps our, our pharmaceutical strategy will put that uh, forward. Do we want to be autonomous in, the, in those products? What we should do to be autonomous in those, prod in, in, in those products and when do we do arrive and having in thought that uh, the, all the scientific knowledge that, that we have now puts that we will need more and more plasma derived products in the next uh, uh, few years. So uh, the needs will continue to, to rise and uh, we should be prepared to have an answer to, to those uh, to the rising uh, needs. I think this is quite important. Thank you very much. I like Thank you. I like the defining uh, target uh, that uh, what does it take and what do we need to get there? And uh, I think that's a, a clarifying uh, approach to, to what we're doing. Uh, I just want to put this to the panel generally. This is something curious to, my, to myself. Why are we just talking about the United States? Why are we getting so much of the plasma from the United States? There are other people out there with plasma to sell us as well if we need it. Can we diversify, Oliver? A very good question, I think. Uh, well, um, as it was already been stated, plasma collection is is very, very uh, regulated, exactly as uh, the production of medicine, uh, plasma draft medicinal products. From this point of view, uh, we as companies are following clear guidelines which are linked to a very technical uh, tool which we call plasma master file. Uh, and I don't want to start uh, discussing or explaining this tool. However, uh, it is clearly stated that, uh, as, it already st also, as it was already stated, we have to guarantee uh, the health of the donors uh, by all means, uh, based on very strict regulations. And I'm pretty sure Stefan, from this point of view, can add additional information on that that uh, within um, in a complex environment, uh, it's easier to, uh, to move instead of something creating uh, something from, from nothing. And therefore, as FDA and EMAR and the commission clearly states what we have to have. So uh, there's a lot of consequence that we're here. Thank you. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I think it's correct as Oliver describes this as um, some quite stringent uh, criteria and procedures to follow before um, plasma can be entered into the EU and used for medicines uh, for our EU citizens. And there, there are, and there are very good reasons for that. And that's of course the safety and quality, but it also means uh, sometimes that it, it might limit some, some, um, some access. It's, it's a very important balance uh, uh, to strike uh, between safety, quality and, and access. Um, Obviously, we don't want <laughs> products to come into the EU that would compromise the, the health or the safety uh, for our EU citizens. Sure. I also another question for you, Stefan, from uh, Shan in the Netherlands. It says, in the Netherlands, we have been able to postpone the tendering process. Uh, how can we, as an EU, join hands and make sure that each patient requiring uh, immunoglobins gets access to the best possible treatments and the uh, and something product and not led by costs best best possible treatment and product not led by costs that's a very difficult one uh, <laughs> okay I, I will i'll try to answer i i think first it's very important and i'm very grateful for this uh discussion that um and uh, i mean P. P. Saru who brought us together on this because i think it's it's very interesting to see that actually there are two 
debates or flows of discussion that we are uh, having today and we see coming together. A first one is how do we make sure there's sufficient plasma physically collected and brought into the EU uh, or in the EU or brought into the EU for our um, EU citizens. And that is that whole chain of uh, donation uh, to to use and with all the steps in the middle and all the actors that, that need to see what they can do and what they can do more and, and better. Um, but there's a second uh, element in here, which clearly is this, the focus of the Ventura study is that there's a, a whole um, access question on uh, related to pricing and uh, reimbursement. And I think you can see that from uh, the sides and the analysis also of uh, Ventura that, that the um, so that there's not a one-on-one -on -one, um, between uh, where plasma is collected and how it is collected and having in the end um, in that same location plasma derivatives available for the citizens. Um, uh, there's, uh, it's, uh, you cannot really say that, that there's an immediate direct link uh, country per country. Um, and that means uh, there's uh, two different elements here that we need uh, to discuss and consider in, in this in this dialogue and in, in this exchange. It's, it's not only how do we how do we collect more and, and make sure overall the, the 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 volume is is higher, but there's also a discussion on on how do we. Uh, make sure that they reach what is collected and reach all the patients across the EU. And unfortunately, that's uh, an even more complex discussion, I, I would say, because it reaches the the national budgets and the national discussions and, and decisions and possibilities. And obviously, uh, it's logical. You cannot expect um, always the same decisions to be made in, in uh, some low GDP countries and in some high GDP countries. And I think that explains, that's another factor that complicates. And there's a discussion not only for PDMP, but it's a very broad discussion that we see in all pharmaceuticals. Thank you for that. I wonder by the end of the von der Leyen Commission whether we will see a healthcare package similar to the COVID response package as part of our long-term industrial strategy as well. Uh, Jean-Philippe Planson, he says, just a couple of comments here, uh, I'll read them out. If the protection of donors with a measure, uh, measured number of collections, uh, say if the EDQM 33 times a year is insured, then we will not be able to have donors who are financially dependent on plasma donation. Then the question of compensation will be relegated to the background. It is necessary to increase the donor base and to work collectively with public and private actors likely to collect under these defined conditions. Jean-Philippe Planson, Chair of the European Patient Organization for Disimmune and Inflammatory Neuropathies. Uh, thank you for that, Jean-Philippe. Um, Martin van Bellen uh, from PPTA also makes a note. Dr. Harvey Alter, 2020 Nobel Prize winner in medicine, quoted some time ago, he said, I want to congratulate the industry, PPTA, making the, for making worst blood product imaginable 20 years ago into the safest blood product we have today. And he says, in addition, there is much data available uh, that a plasma donation is safe for donors. In fact, plasma donors have less donor adverse events than whole blood donors and platelet donors. As mentioned today, uh, Martin says, the main safety issue today is no access to treatment for patients. Then any growth in plasma collection over the past 10 years? And put this to the panel, uh, which recommendations does the panel have to member states to remove barriers for the private sector to be able to collect more plasma? So if uh, public sector and NGOs um, haven't contributed to growth of plasma collection, what can the private sector uh, do in this? Who wants to answer that? Thomas, you want to kick off? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's a tricky question. I think it's a fundamental one. Uh, I mean, what we're observing, and I think we can all agree, not just in PDMPs, but across the healthcare system, especially in the times of stress like in COVID, is a growing disconnect between all stakeholders. The patients are being pulled away, the payers are being pulled away in the same way the industry and the industry reputation suffers. Uh, so I think it is the absolutely fundamental solution to ensure that both plasma and reimbursement is appropriate, is bringing these stakeholders together. And I think this is the point that Stefan made earlier, and I want to really accentuate it, that whether it is private-public initiative, 
or is it the reimbursement coverage extension? None of these will happen unless we jointly come to a consensus that these are necessary measures. I have been involved recently in 150 stakeholder meetings um, around oncology, so a different topic. But it, it, the, the solutions that we came, we came up with came from every country and every stakeholder. Plasma is a global phenomenon. Plasma solutions are a global phenomenon. In the same sense, no single country, no single stakeholder, regulator alone, or payer alone, or patient alone can solve that issue. So what I urge, for whatever solution that can come up with, is really bringing the stakeholders together across the countries and across different types. Uh, and that would be my sort of overarching, almost philosophical, <laughs> if you will, recommendation. Uh, of course, uh, I think Stefan has already covered the, the issue that reimbursement is paramount. However, if there's not enough plasma, reimbursement is pointless because we are reimbursing nothing. Uh, so the two are conjoined, the two are two sides of the same coin. And I think every country is, will do very, very well given the huge socioeconomic impact of PDMPs and also psychosocial impact of PDMPs. Let's not forget about that, that psychological well being of all the patients is at stake. So every country will do very, very well if they reconsider their reimbursement policy and ultimately also procurement okay. policy. It's a chain of value. Let's start with plasma, let's solve let's get to the optimal treatment, but only together as all stakeholders. Thank you. Oliver. Brian, yeah, uh, thank you, Thomas. You already paved the way, I think. Uh, and uh, Stefan says the same here. Um, if I just um, go back to that, what Isabella stated, um, and Lina Annemans at the beginning of the, at the introduction. So Isabella stated in Italy, for example, uh, tender only price-based. And Lina stated exactly the opposite. We should look into value. We should uh, look into network systems and bring them together at the end of the day to, do, uh, to talk about uh, added, added value which is created. So in Italy, first where I live and work mainly, uh, we have uh, silos and the pharmaceutical budget is not directly linked to, for example, the other hospital expenditure. So if you don't bring these different cost elements together in order to see what is the overall cost for treatment, you will never ever come to a clear answer. And I think this is something we have to be, uh, this has to be seen. And last but not least, uh, the, system, uh, the sustainability of the system can only be worked out if all these pieces are led together. Um, this is my piece. Not a new one. Okay, anyone else on this for another question? No, okay. So a question from the audience. Uh, might the current focus on COVID-19 convalescent plasma have a negative impact on the production of PDMPs for the treatment of rare diseases. Uh, Patricia, Anneli, uh, you want to comment on this? So, might the current focus on COVID-19 convalescent plasma have a negative impact on the production of PDMPs for the treatment of rare diseases? Oh, I, I think this is something we um, uh, we all fear, and uh, that is a wor definite worry for patients as well. Um, so time will tell, but with the, the production process time of, of immunoglobulins of somewhere between six, six and 12 months, we uh, should expect uh, uh, shortages, and, and that is a scary thought, and it would be very interesting to see how those will be solved. Thank you. We also have a question specifically on that as well. Anneli, do you want to answer to this as well? And I'm bringing to Stefan. Anneli, you have a question? Yeah. 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 No, I totally agree with Patricia. So that is not much that because we are worried about how the situation will be. But I think the question was a little bit yeah. different. Uh, maybe you are you were more about the production, if they will use the plasma for the, this will uh, yeah, I think Oliver may, might be the better person to answer that okay. one. Uh, yes. Stefan has hand up first, and I'll come and bring Oliver in. Stefan? It would be good because actually I will end with a small question for Oliver, if that's fine. <laughs> um, I, I think, um, I think you, it's important to distinguish between the impact of COVID-19 and the impact of COVID, convalescent COVID-19 plasma. Yeah. 
I think the impact of COVID-19 is like many activities in the, in the world, we have seen a reduction and that's also applying on collection of plasma. And we have seen a drop in Q2, fortunately it looks that it's largely recovered, but we are keeping and we need to keep our eye on what it will mean in the end after several months on the supply of the derivatives. Uh, EMA, our colleagues uh, in the European Medicines Agency are therefore regularly talking to the manufacturers um, fortunately, there are contingency plans, there were stocks, but we need to see, of course, how in the end, it, there's many factors to consider, so we need to keep following this. Now, that's one. The impact on of convalescent COVID plasma is actually, uh, um, my personal first thinking is that it's, it's not necessarily so negative, because um, it is putting plasma and the value of plasma on the political agenda. It creates uh, a, an awareness with population that there's more need for plasma collection. It has created initiatives like uh, our, with our European um, um, support, emergency support uh, instrument to help increase plasma collection in, in some uh, member states. So I think it's very important in the end that we will keep that distinction that you cannot, there, I think there is a possible and a risk for a drop in plasma derivatives in the coming months, but I don't think it would be correct to attribute it to the convalescent uh, COVID-19 plasma. Now, a question I had to, to Oliver is because actually, if there's more plasma collected, if there's new donors uh, that come to donate convalescent um, plasma, actually, what do you need out of there is only one kind of antibody that addresses and attacks the COVID-19 virus but there's many other elements in the plasma. How, to what degree are, are you possible as manufacturers to, um, to make that split? How fine can you, can you select this COVID-19 antibody out? And does it mean that if there's now new donations for COVID-19 plasma, that you actually get some additional extra products also for other supply? Wow. Uh, Another question. Thank you, Stefan. This is a very tricky one, Stefan, but uh, may I first answer uh, the first question, which is easier, because you already gave almost, Brian, uh, thank you for bringing Stefan first into the discussion. So Stefan already answered uh, the two questions. Uh, based on, on my personal understanding, I think it is all in this view, uh, there is a clear differentiation between convalescent plasma on the one hand and uh, uh, the lack, uh, let's say, uh, the reduction of uh, plasma collection due to COVID. Uh, Stefan already mentioned that uh, never ever we had such much, uh, so much focus on plasma uh, due to COVID. So therefore, if it's not today the time to uh, bring more donors into, into plasma collection centers or transfusion centers which work with plasmapheresis, then I don't know when which should happen. So plasma today is uh, uh, is really one of the top uh, talking points when you're talking about COVID. Both the, uh, the direct um, uh, therapy based on a convalescent plasma, exactly as Isabella Quinty mentioned, but also the idea to produce hyperimmunes out of convalescent plasma. This, uh, the second one there, hyperimmune production, of course, uh, one thing is the production. And the donors we are currently using for this kind of uh, product, uh, of course, they are only patients which did overcome the disease of uh, the infection of COVID-19. And therefore, we're able to create these uh, antibodies against uh, COVID-19. Their plasma normally couldn't be given, couldn't be donated in normal situations. So this is something very, very specific based on the, uh, on the regulations. And in order to see if this is a hopeful, is, is, is a successful treatment, uh, a, a, a huge uh, phase three study uh, has just started last week where several companies are working together to produce this uh, study drug in order to give them this product to uh, the hospitals in a, in a study which is managed by uh, the National Health Institute uh, of uh, in obviously the United States. Uh, concerning 
the um, the lack of plasma, which might happen, uh, we have seen a drop exactly as Stefan stated, and uh, during the during the lockdown and the social distancing. So therefore, there is something. How much it will be? Uh, Emma knows better because this is something which, of course, each company knows better than than someone who represents the, uh, the overall industry. Okay, thank you. Um, Isabella, you still with us there? Let me unmute you for a second. Yes. Um, just how, what are the treatment options? I put this to all the panel. You know, we, nobody's mentioned synthetic options. I know that's, that's something way out on the horizon. But, uh, science is advancing quickly. Is there any prospect of a synthetic solution uh, in this realm, uh, within this generation? Uh, I don't think for now, and there are, I mean, not very, I think five years ago this debate started, and I, I, I don't see any paper published on this, so I think it was an attempt. I think that there are some basic science trial going on, but I think it's not for now. This is my impression. I don't know all okay. if you have news about that. I don't think so for now. I think what Stefan said earlier is this has put plasma on the radar. COVID has put plasma on the political radar. And um, if ever you want to get funding for any further research, uh, politicians need to, to uh, have that in their, their view uh, to, for it to happen as well. Um, Tom nodding enthusiastically there as well. Do you have uh, something to add there? <laughs> um, well, I, I completely agree with both Stefan and Oliver about putting plasma on the pedestal that it's always deserved but never had. Uh, so not only are we all talking about a vaccine, but we are talking about an actual treatment which plasma can offer. In fact, it's even much, it's much more urgent to come up with a treatment for those affected right now. And obviously the vaccine, however important it is, is something that will be universally used in the future. Uh, but there's something more that COVID has revealed. And I think that's, it, it, you know, I'm putting it in very much in inverted commas. It's a benefit of COVID. Professor Animans very rightly has put this powerful, but also very simple triangle of sustainability, quality, and solidarity. And solidarity is such an important element. However, very often we are not, we don't have that solidarity because we don't have enough empathy with those that suffer. So we have all, through COVID, been put in a situation that many of the primary immune deficiencies and secondary immune deficiencies patients are every day. The lockdown situation, the quarantine situation, is the similar situation that many of those patients in high level of anxiety of infection have on a daily basis. So suddenly we have, we are all in a possession to empathize with these patients and understand how huge they need for the appropriate treatment, for treatment in the first place, but then for the optimal treatment is. Okay. For the resilience of the healthcare system, you know, patients with hemophilia, that has never been mentioned in this discussion yet. You know, when we cannot get to a doctor because of COVID, this is very often the case with hemophilia patients who don't get prophylaxis, but get only ad hoc treatment. So for them, it's, they experience that on a daily or monthly basis. So I think what COVID has revealed is that we should be more empathetic to the huge unmet need that's okay. and now we are in a position to understand it from different angles. Yeah. Thank you. I think according to The Economist, empathy is still an emerging market. So we'll pay attention <laughs> to how that develops. Um, okay, we're coming close to the end of our time. I'm going to do a quick wrap up and then uh, Helmut uh, Gooking. Um, if you could switch your video on so I can actually see that you're there in real life, it'd be great. And he's going to do the conclusion after that as well. So I'm just going to give our panelists this is your sign, but this is not a repeat of anything. 20 seconds each uh, for your, your highlights. Uh, what matters to you most in this? I'm gonna start at the top of my window here. Uh, Oliver, 20 seconds. Yeah, very simply speaking, uh, we already stated that uh, the two items are absolutely a key and must. Uh, firstly, uh, have more access to plasma, and secondly, uh, more equal reimbursement systems which allow all patients to achieve this treatment. And in this context, uh, as Thomas stated, it's not only uh, immunoglobulins. There are a lot of other therapies which are treated and quite often life-saving products are given due to plasma therapeutic uh, medical products. So uh, we only focus today on one area, but also the others are key 
and uh, quite often they are very tiny, uh, tiny patient groups, but they need uh, their support exactly as the ones we were talking about today. Thank, Thank you. you. Patricia, 20 seconds, last comment. Let's all make uh, the general public aware of the possibility to donate plasma. I used to donate blood, and at that time, I was not aware of the possibility to donate plasma. So there must be more of those people out there. I'm one of them. Thank you. Uh, and Nelly? And I also think it's important to realize that uh, uh, the patient organization is really important here to spread awareness. We know the country we act in, so, and so, so the support to the patient organization is very important. And I also think it's important that we dare to talk about, there are so many holy cows in this area. I mean, uh, we have heard, we have discussed some of them here today, but it, not for, it must not be forbidden to talk about it. We don't know the answer yet, but we, we don't reach any goal to more plasma if we don't dare to talk about the situation, because these are so different in every country. So I think it also, we must pay respect to each country, but we still must discuss the questions. Okay, off to the abattoir with the holy cows. Uh, Stefan? Thank you. I, I think that the big learning here is important to keep an eye on, on the big picture and that we have really two important elements here to work on. One is making sure we, we collect more plasma and, and get it into the EU or, um, or, or in the EU immediately. And, and secondly, um, that we then also need to make sure that this uh, reaches all the patients who, who need this most. Um, so um, yeah, a lot of work uh, to come, I think. Thank you, Isabella. So two points. First, no more tender, please. Second one, uh, a better connection with basic science. Uh, basic immunology may teach us something that uh, is important to know. So better connection between uh, different science, uh, also clinical science and basic immunology. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas. Ah, uh, you're on mute, one second. I got you. Hold on. There we go. go again. Mute. It has been competing with each other. Uh, <laughs> so two main points that have already been mentioned by either one of the panelists or by the animals. So one is a reminder. Uh, and I was very empathetic and very uh, philosophical in many of the points. So I'll be very quantitative now. Let's remember how huge a socioeconomic value of PDMPs is in numbers. In hemophilia and primary immunodeficiencies alone, by avoiding disability and extending life, we can quantify it as 2 billion euros per year. These numbers should work on imagination. We can avoid 1.5 billion euros of associated costs, such as hospitalizations. These are huge numbers. So it is not just the science, it is not just our opinion. There's also money and socioeconomic benefit involved, and psychosocial aspects. So with all that benefit in mind, I want to repeat one more thing that Stefan and- You have five seconds. <laughs> Let's put our differences aside and find a solution to plasma availability and availability of optimal treatments. I mean, optimal, as Isabella said, um, in the multi-stakeholder platform. That's it for me. <laughs> Thank you, much appreciated. I have a quick uh, wrap of notes, now we're gonna hand over to Helmut uh, Gucking. I don't think it's helping in the picture right now, but uh, let's see what happens by the time I'm finished. Uh, so wrap up, just uh, PDMP is a fragile ecosystem, uncertain plasma donation volumes, differing reimbursement processes in the EU. And uh, let me just put you on mute there. And uh, the EU uh, and member states' policies must recognize the unique nature of PDMPs and the unique nature of the plasma ecosystem. EU and member states' policies must improve patient access and availability of PDMPs. And there is across the EU as well, which uh, are critical uh, in terms of being addressed. The EU uh, pharma strategy consultation process uh, addresses the role, must address the reliance on the imports of medicines and starting materials. And Europe must collect more plasma. I think we heard that lots and lots today. And uh, we got to do it urgently because uh, the diagnostic system uh, has that demand on the, the need for, for uh, these drugs and uh, for treatments and generic drugs. Uh, they're not uh, to be considered as such. More research is needed. Education is needed on what plasma is and 
uh, also the, the quality of adjusted life years, the cost benefit analysis, if we're actually gonna have tenders, and I'm, I'm sorry Isabel, it's probably gonna be the case, um, what can we do to improve that, that process as well? And the EU-US importation gap, uh, we need to diversify our markets, and I'm sure we have ways that we can do that. Synthetic products, um, somebody's got to fund that. Um, some, uh, some are out there in the future. Uh, standardization, harmonization of processes and data is critical as well. That's all from me. I'm going to thank panelists for their excellent contributions today. I, I enjoyed this. It was uh, uh, light and uh, concise. Thank you for all your excellent timekeeping. And to our audience as well, thank you for your attention and for the questions that you sent in as well. I checked with the team. Any questions that weren't answered, uh, you'll get a reply uh, from uh, the PPTA uh, team directly as well. Feel free to send uh, more as we're closing to Helmut uh, Gooking, how are you Welcome. ready to speak? Good to see you. Yeah, see. Vielen Good Dank. afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thanks What a lot for giving the floor. You're welcome. Aus Zeitgründen war es mir leider nicht möglich, die gesamte, das gesamte Meeting jetzt zu verfolgen. Uh, es ist mir jedoch eine Ehre und auch eine ganz besondere Freude, mich bei Ihnen heute für dieses erfolgreiche Meeting und den wunderbaren Beiträgen und den Diskussionen zu bedanken. Well, to the lack of time, I was unfortunately not able to follow the whole meeting today. However, it is my honor and pleasure to thank you for this successful meeting and the wonderful contributions and discussions. Eines wurde mehr als deutlich, zumindest für mich. Wir alle haben ein Ziel, Patienten einen angemessenen Zugang zur Plasmatherapie zu ermöglichen. One thing became more than clear to me. We all have one goal, to give patients adequate access to plasma therapies. Es wurde ja auch bereits in der Diskussion schon angesprochen. Also Zahlen aus 2015 belegen, dass Europa einen weltweiten Anteil von ca. 17% Prozent des gesamten Plasmas aufweist. Amerika hingegen gut 64%. Prozent. Das macht mehr als deutlich, dass Handlungsbedarf besteht, so wie es auch hier bereits angesprochen wurde. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, in the discussions we have already seen, and as figures show as well, figures from 2015, Europe has a worldwide share of about 17% of the collected plasma, while America has more than 64%. As already has been mentioned during this discussion, there is a need for action. Nach meiner Auffassung nach besteht allerdings auch ein Informationsdefizit bei der Bevölkerung in Europa. Um, in my opinion, however, there is also an information deficit among the population in Europe. Ich will auch kurz erklären. Der Unterschied zwischen Vollblutspende und Plasmaspende ist den wenigsten Bürgern überhaupt geläufig. To explain, very few people are familiar with the difference between whole blood donation and plasma donation. Also die Möglichkeit, vier bis sechs Mal im Jahr Blut zu spenden, ist den Bürgern gegenwärtig. Jedoch dass Plasmaspenden bis zu 60 Mal im Jahr möglich sind, ist vielen Bürgern überhaupt nicht bewusst oder bekannt. The possibility to donate blood four to six times a year is a well-known fact. However, many citizens are not aware that plasma donation is possible up to 60 times a year. Also hier sollte man durchaus nach meiner Auffassung nach ansetzen, da die Hilfsbereitschaft der Menschen grundsätzlich vorhanden ist. Wenn ich diesen Gedankenstoß einmal geben darf, also entsprechende Kampagnen diesbezüglich betrachte ich als zielführend und auch gewinnbringend. Mm -hmm. um, according to my opinion, this is the starting point for action. Since in principle people wish to help, my idea would be to run campaigns for plasma donation. I do think such campaigns for plasma donation are target oriented and very mm -hmm. successful. Also jetzt Zusätzlich auf Covid-19 möchte ich nicht eingehen, außer dass deutlich wurde, dass wir Produktionsstätten auf verschiedensten Ebenen in der Gesundheitsvorsorge grundsätzlich wieder nach Europa zurückholen müssen. Ich glaube, da besteht auch Konsens. Well, I do not want to go into further detail with regard to Covid-19, but I do think it became clear that we have to bring back all kind of production sites to Europe and this as well with regard to the health care and health sector. Dazu steht fest, dazu steht fest, dass der Bedarf am Plasma heute schon nicht abzudecken ist. 
und sich dank der modernen Medizin zunehmend noch erheblich erhöhen wird. Mm -hmm. um, we all know that the demand for plasma is not even covered today. And there will be an increase in demand because of modern medicine and modern technologies. Also es ist unsere Aufgabe der Politik, Rahmenbedingungen zu schaffen, dass wir die damit aufgeworfenen Herausforderungen bewältigen können. So I do think it is our task as politicians to create the framework conditions that will enable us to meet the forthcoming challenges. Das bedeutet natürlich auch, identifizierte Lösungen weiter zu verfolgen und letztendlich auch umzusetzen, damit die Menschen einen besseren Therapiezugang erhalten und die Verfügbarkeit erheblich gesteigert wird. This, of course, also means pursuing and ultimately implementing identified solutions, so that people have better access to treatment and so as to make sure that availability will be significantly increased. Also abschließend bleibt mir jetzt nur noch einen ganz großen Dank an die Organisation auszusprechen und mich bei Ihnen allen für Ihr Engagement und Ihren Beiträgen zu bedanken. Well, to come to an end, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the organizers of this discussion and I would like to thank you all for your commitment. Es sind Menschen und Veran Sie und Veranstaltungen die deutlich aufzeigen, wie wichtig Plasmaspenden sind. Sie retten Leben. Mm -hmm. Dafür sage ich Danke. Um, it is uh, people like you and events like this one that clearly show how important plasma donations are. You all save lives. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Gürking. Thank you also for our translation uh, this afternoon too. And uh, with that, uh, we come to an end. Uh, you can continue to tweet uh, using the hashtags uh, that we called out earlier. Ich mach das nicht extra, and, uh, Helmut. We, we wish you a good afternoon and uh, welcome to Miasu. Aufbau. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian.